Hi, everyone. My name is Beth Keen. I'm the CEO of Holocaust Museum LA. Welcome to this evening's program, Fragile Democracies and the Refugee Crisis, a conversation with Hayes. I just wanted to start uh, by saying I, I know we've all been devastated by the recent attacks uh, by Hamas on Israel and the shocking surge in anti-Semitism that we're seeing around the globe, which is really frightening and happening at lightning speed. And uh, I think the latest statistic from the ADL was that we've seen an increase in by 400% the last couple of weeks. 400% just over the last couple of weeks. That, that's just shocking. And I've been speaking to a lot of Holocaust survivors. We have one in the room, Henry Slecky. Uh, who you'll, you'll hear about later. He actually, Hyas got him to the United States after the war. Uh, and you know they, they are reliving their worst nightmares. And one thing though, I stay positive just because the work that we are doing at the museum is so important and making such a huge impact. And so that makes me feel good. The museum's mission to inspire humanity through truth and education could not be more relevant and is so critical right now. Our mission has always been grounded in teaching the lessons of the Holocaust and its social relevance to whatever social justice issues are happening. And we empower students and visitors of all ages to stand up and speak out against hatred, bigotry, and anti-Semitism. And we know that our programs are working. Students are here all day long. Today we were packed with a few hundred students and we know we're changing student behavior. So if they come to the museum as bystanders, they leave as upstanders. And that's what we need to focus on, changing student behaviors. Uh, I'm finding just from all the news, you know, there, there are the haters, we're never gonna change them, but there are the, the group in the middle whose minds we can still change, and that's what we need to focus on. And so every day we uh, are constantly changing our education resources for teachers. It's very fluid right now because how the situation's evolving so we are just so busy here working in overdrive and our docents are amazing. They are so dedicated to this work. So we're truly grateful and we have some of them in the room. Raise your hands, I see you around here. Thank you so much for everything you do. And we have an amazing staff who's, who works so hard. So I just wanted to share that because with all the pain that we're feeling, you know, we, we do feel good about the work that we're doing here to make a difference. And also, I think it's so important to come together as a community. I'm finding, personally, I get a lot of comfort by having programs like this and being around people like you and having these important panel discussions. This one, particularly tonight, is so relevant as well. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Just really fast, I wanted to share, we're actually the oldest Holocaust Museum in the United States. We were founded by Holocaust survivors in 1961 who met at Hollywood High School taking an English class. And they realized they each had a photograph, letter, or some kind of uh, precious object from before, during, or after the war. And they wanted to create a safe space where they could remember family members who had perished, but also to start to pool these precious objects and to start educating young people about the Holocaust and what they had personally endured. So that's how the museum got started, and we are free for students. We provide bus grants for the Title I school, so we make the field trip completely affordable, which is so important, otherwise these, these you know, kids would never um, get to come here. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit about who we are. So Mark is the president and CEO of Hyas. Since taking on this role a decade ago, Mark has led the transformation of Hyas from help, helping refugees because they were Jewish to helping refugees because we are Jewish. Emiliana Guerica is founder and executive director of the Women's March Foundation and Women's March Action, 
where she advocates for women's rights, Latino education, and gender equality. And Zoe Winkler Rhinus, who is the founder of This Is About Humanity, an organization that raises awareness about separated and reunified families and children at the US-Mexico border. And now I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, our very own Jordana Gessler, who is the museum's VP of Education and Exhibits. Thank you, Beth, and thank you everyone for being here this evening with us. I know that this conversation and panel will be discussing mostly and talking about democracy and refugee crises and how we can do more to support people looking to come to the US or to be resettled who are escaping persecution and violence. I of course know that the events of October 7th have maybe impacted the way we're thinking about the world and so I first want to ask a question a little bit off topic to Mark. Um, and we are seeing right now in Israel the largest displaced persons movement within the country since 1948. And that's something that's really personal for me because my grandmother was actually a displaced person in Israel in 1948 after surviving a series of bombs in Jerusalem, the Ben Yehuda Street bombing, she and her four younger brothers and sister had to be taken in by other families. And so I'm wondering, Mark, what is Hyas doing right now for people on the ground who are displaced? Yeah, just a little bit of background on Hyas in Israel, right? I mean, Hyas is the oldest refugee agency in the world. We were founded 120 years ago to help Jews who were fleeing anti-Semitism and uh, this was a hard job because there was no place for Jews to go. This changed in 1948, and so we opened up in, in Israel to help people make Aliyah. There's, there was already the Jewish Agency for Israel to help with that, but Hyas still operated in places where the Jewish Agency could not operate. So, for example, all Moroccan Jews who made Aliyah actually came through Hyas. Um, Jews from Tunisia, it was the same thing. We operated in Sudan as well. Uh, to help with the with the exodus of the of the Ethiopian Jews, and so this is what our focus was for most of our history in Israel. But but what we did in Israel was a reflection of what we've done in the rest of the world, which is we started helping refugees not because they were Jewish, but because we are. So we were helping the Eritrean asylum seekers, uh, the Sudanese asylum seekers, um, Ukrainians who were coming recently, and this had really become the the focus of our work, giving taking them to court, uh, trying to get them protection, trying to prevent them from being removed from Israel. Um, but now we find ourselves back once again doing something we never thought we'd be doing in Israel, which is helping um, displaced Jews, um, as well as the Eritreans, the Ethiopians, um, the Sudanese, uh, the, the, the Thai workers. Um, that also need assistance. In fact, they're the most vulnerable people in, in Israel right now. So we've had to give assistance both to them and to many of the 500,000 displaced. And just today, our team was distributing um, cash and food items uh, to displaced Eritreans who were forced to flee. Um, but now we're providing mental health and psychosocial services to uh, displaced Israelis, uh, cash-based assistance, and, and also non-food items. And we're not supposed to call them um, displaced persons, but that is what they are. I mean, the, the official term we're calling them is evacuees. Well, it's incredible the work that you're doing and the work that you have done. Um, I just wanted to give space to acknowledge what you're doing right now in the face of crises and violence. But sort of going back a bit to on topic, um, you have spoken in Congress about the importance of safeguarding policies for refugees. And recently we've seen our own struggles as a democracy, as simple as having a hard time finding a house speaker, which we just got yesterday. Um, how does this affect policy when it comes to refugees who are already here, people who are waiting to enter, as well as USAID abroad? Yeah, there has not been a problem solving approach in our Congress for decades. Um, as far as I'm concerned, at least when it comes to refugee, asylum, and immigration issues, as we were talking about before, the panel, when I started my career a long time ago, like in the late 1980s, uh, the Congress had just passed the uh, IRCA, uh, the Immigration Reform and Control Act, and that was the last time that we, we reformed our immigration system uh, to deal with uh, undocumented people. And now the only way for people to regularize their status is through applying for asylum, just because there is no other channel. 
So the asylum backlog is now we have three million people who are stuck in a backlog in our asylum system, which takes them years uh, to get through and to get protection. Um, it's, it's totally broken and Congress has abdicated their responsibility across administrations uh, to get this fixed. And then there are examples right now about the dysfunction. Like, for example, um, Hyas was very involved here in California, here in LA as well, uh, with the rescue of Afghans after the fall of Kabul. And uh, as you know, there were over 80,000 of them that were evacuated to the United States, but they were brought here so quickly the United States didn't bother or wasn't able to give them refugee status. Instead, it brought them under this limbo status of parole. And so they don't have access to a green card. They don't have access to permanent residence. They don't have access to family reunification. Um, they really are in a state of legal limbo. And so we've, we've uh, been advocating through a bipartisan effort to pass the Afghan Adjustment Act. And uh, it's a bipartisan bill. There is absolutely no rational reason for anybody to oppose this legislation, which would give these Afghans a green card, which they would have to apply for. Uh, some uh, politicians said, well, they weren't vetted. They were brought here so quickly. We can't just give them a green card. But that's actually the point of the legislation. The point is it would require them to step forward, you know, get vetted, and actually apply and get in the system rather than being in limbo. But a single senator prevented the Afghan Adjustment Act from passing last year, Senator Grassley from Iowa and his staff. Otherwise, we would have gotten it through. We had Democratic, we had Republican support, but because at that time he was chair of the Judici Judiciary Committee, he was able to prevent this bill from moving ahead. Um, so that's just some examples of our dysfunctional democracy. Right now we have one congressman, Congressman Jim Jordan, who is preventing um, the extension of the Lautenberg Amendment, which gives Iranian Jews, Christians, and Baha'i access to the refugee program. Again, a single congressman is able to block this legislation that's always had bipartisan support. So when it comes to immigration and refugee issues, there's a, a lot of examples of dysfunction. And I sort of want to ask Zoe, you see firsthand the dysfunction and the democratic backsliding that our, our government is doing right now for people seeking asylum and for refugees. Your work is on the border here in California. How are you seeing those policies impact and affect kids and adults at the border? So a lot of the um, <clears throat> shelters that we work with, usually people were there for 30 days and then they would move on and um, uh, seek asylum and wait for their number to be called. Now families are there for six months, eight months. These um, shelters that usually would hold 100 people are now you know, like 275 people sleeping in one shelter. Um, at one of the ones we work with, it's one family per tent. We met an Afghan family the last time we were there a month ago who had seven children. They were all in one tent. Um, at the other shelter that we work with, it's one family per bed. They just don't have the room. So families are literally just waiting there for their entire life to be able to begin. And it could be months, weeks, a year. And then they're all waiting now to get on to this app. Well, all of our phones glitch all the time. So if they miss that one moment that they can press the button and get into the app, they have to wait. They go back to the, the, the end of the line. So it's just an impossible sort of cycle where it's just built to fail and it just continues to fail. And now people are just sort of losing hope, which is the most painful part. But where they are right now, even in one tent, is better than where they've come from. Emiliana, you were telling me earlier today that you came here as a child with your family and experienced some of these obstacles that our, our government puts in place to limit what people can and cannot access. And just because we're sitting here in Holocaust Museum LA, during the 1930s, the State Department actively would work to not allow Jewish refugees to enter this country. We didn't have glitchy apps at that time, but we had tons of paperwork that was required, and if it wasn't filled out by a specific date, people had to start all over again. And I'm wondering a little bit about how your personal experiences have shaped your professional career. Um, right, so I, so I wanna clarify. I, I crossed the border um, at nine without my parents. So I was one of those kids. But 
once I, we got to the United States, the nightmare begins because there is no way for you to do it legally. The, the process is so chaotic and it's expensive and you cannot understand it. And it doesn't matter that they say, oh, the forms are in Spanish. Okay, but an attorney has to translate them, right? Oh, then we've missed the deadline. Now, I, so I personally at 16 had to emancipate from my parents because as the act was put in for, um, to access a green card, you aged out at 16. So now my parents had to decide that only part of them would be legal and the rest would be up to them, right? So the process is difficult, the process is expensive, and it is confusing for someone that not only does not speak the language, but is struggling to survive. When they say you have to do it legally, okay, who has $15,000 to put down on forms on something that may not happen, right? And, but also the other thing that we don't talk about is that this country is built on the back of immigrants mm -hmm. and continues to be built on the back of immigrants. So the fact that we do not have immigration reform and election after election tells us they don't want to fix it. And now that we've heard a little bit about the struggles, I think, with even in a democratic country like this, I want to focus maybe on some action items and things for positive change. So I'm wondering, um, Mark, this question is for you, if you can share a little bit about what efforts Hyas is doing to make the United States and other countries safe havens for refugees and immigrants and asylum seekers, excuse me. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's what we spend all of our time doing and and the problem is that our, our biggest enemy is frankly misinformation right I would say that's that's job number one is trying to dispel misinformation um, we especially saw a lot of it during the last presidential not the, during the 2016 presidential campaign um, and uh, we expect to see it again in 2024 uh, you know comparisons of refugees who are resettled um, to uh, to people who cross the border without authorization uh, accusations that we don't know who they are. Now, uh, certain presidential candidates actually been saying that uh, the refugee resettlement program is letting in people from Hamas and therefore he has to end it. You know, all these things are total falsehoods. The, there is no more secure way to enter the United States than through the refugee resettlement program. Uh, refugees are thoroughly vetted. Um, they are hand selected, uh, each and every one of them, in order just to get an interview for the process. So, and, and there's never been an, an, a lethal act of terror from any refugee who's been resettled in the United States in the, since the existence of the program starting in 1975. So it's, um, but it's this misinformation that we have to constantly fight. And then the, the other aspect of it is there's such a, a populist, because this is the, the, one of the issues with democracy is, of course, the, the rise of populism. And there's a, a populist uh, uh, demand that our borders be sealed. And so there's been billions of dollars invested in border enforcement. Um, but there has been nothing invested in actual decision makers for immigration applications. So they're apprehending all of these people who are crossing the border, uh, but then they have no, they don't have any place to send them in terms of immigration court. They're not getting their decisions made. So that's why the backlog of asylum cases is now three million cases strong, because there's been no investment in immigration decision makers, which makes the, the s system totally dysfunctional. And it, you can't enforce your borders when people are coming over, getting caught, and then can't have a decision reached in terms of whether or not they deserve protection. So, you know, we keep trying to fight that fight, but the number one job is to fight the misinformation uh, that is out there, and that's, that's tough. I'm sure now, especially with the access in which people can spread hateful messages, it's making it even more difficult to fight that misinformation. And bringing it a little bit to back to like the empathetic personal approach, Beth was mentioning earlier how Holocaust Museum LA has over 25,000 students visit annually here for docent tours to hear from Holocaust survivors like Henry who was speaking to a group this morning, but to really connect and hear personal stories and form these empathetic connections. And Zoe, you were telling me earlier that you were just quote, a, a mom who felt this pull 
to do something. And you take a lot of trips with for people from Los Angeles down to the border to have these empathetic reactions to meet people who are, are trying to get to this country. Can you speak a little bit about how you were inspired to become an activist and how do meeting, how, how do the person to person conversations really help the cause of your organization? Well, I think the person to person aspect is everything because you can hear a story, you can hear what people say, you can read about it on the news, you can watch a story, but when you meet these families and you listen to their stories, there's no way then to really just admire their strength and be all in. So that's why we really bring people down is because we think it's the most important thing is to go and bear witness yourself, to hear the stories yourself, to meet the people yourself. Um, you know, before this, I really didn't have any background in this world. I don't know anything about immigration, and I don't pretend to. But what I do believe in is that we should all be treated with grace and humanity, and we've lost that completely. And so when we go down to the border and we hear these stories, um, I actually, when I started This Is About Humanity five years ago with my two co-founders, on one of our very first trips, I met a little girl named Zoe, and she was six at the time. And uh, two years ago, she crossed, actually, and I followed her all the way through. And I'm now her sponsor here in the United States. Um, and so when I went through the process with her, you know, they were granted um, humanitarian parole. And it was three days where there was sort of letting people in, and then it shut again. It was August 26th. And um, when I was going over the forms with her, and I am an American citizen, I am educated, I could not figure it out for the life of me. I had to reach out to our partners at Immigrant Defenders Law Center, who are the only pro bono law firm in Los Angeles that are committed to reunifying every family that's been separated. And um, they had to help me. Um, and so I think the most important thing is that when something feels so big and it feels so separate from you, it's really hard to even begin to understand it. But when you go down, you help. We just opened a kitchen in Tijuana. We took over World Central Kitchen's kitchen. They were closing their doors. They really never went to sort of anything other than a, a location for a couple months at a time. They'd been there for a year. We took it over. We feed 3,000 people a day, um, and we employ all those um, people that are living at the shelters trying to just wait for their chance. It's a legal right to seek asylum, and we've taken that away. The Trump administration was able during COVID to stop people from presenting, and we've just been in this sort of circle ever since. And so I believe that the only way you can really learn is by hearing someone's story. And so that's why we encourage everyone to hear, to listen, to go and meet these families before they make a uh, before they make an assumption that they have absolutely no idea what is going on. Emiliana, I would say that the Women's March is one of the most well-known organizations today, at least in my circles. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering how did you get into this position and find your power as a leader and advocate to, to really fight for change? I think just like Zoe, I don't come from a nonprofit background. Um, I. You know, I am an entrepreneur. I own an event production company. I co-own restaurants, and I was fine until 2016. And so I, I, I started to look at um, what was happening, right? Um, during that election, we heard rhetoric on immigrants. We heard rhetoric on women. We heard rhetoric on everything. And when was it going to be time for us to say enough? Right? And as my dad said, don't, don't piss off the women. <laughs> so um, for me as a volunteer, I volunteered what I knew about event production. And the day after the election, I um, signed for permits and registered permits for a march in Los Angeles. Because for me, it was critical that everyone march, not just go to DC, because what happens locally will affect you more. Um, so I was, we were on calls. I met all of my co-organizers online. Um, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, 
So, but I thought after the march, I truly thought that I was going to go back to my um, to my event production company, and I and I couldn't. I couldn't. Not only that, but I thought it was a betrayal to everyone that marched, but also to my kids that also are, are feminists, right? So for me, I needed to come to a decision that I was going to continue this um, journey. Uh, so I started a nonprofit and we <laughs> gathered a ton of volunteers. We were organizing from our garage. And if you bought a shirt, thank you. It was shipped from my garage and backyard. Um, but there comes a point where um, you have to fight for justice for all. I mean, I'm married to a Jewish black man, right? Half Jewish, half black. And, and so that connection to uh, making sure that we take care of the earth came from Jewish values. You know, when we were dating, it was like, I kid you not, the second coffee I had with him, he said, um, our kids will have to be raised Jewish. And I was like, do not call me again. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is a lot. Um, but realistically, it was really important to him, and you've met him, it was really important to him. And I thought, wow, I don't think that I've ever had someone say to me, this is why my family values, I am the last of my last name and my dad escaped the Holocaust. So I am like, I would have betrayed that had I just gone back to produce events and festivals and, and, and run restaurants. I needed to do more because I think that we have this little short time in, in, in this world and Jewish values are about protecting it and making sure that we leave it better than how received it. That's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Um, and actually, I just want to do a follow-up question really quickly and hear your opinion on what do you think the role of grassroots movements are in advocating for rights of refugees, uh, particularly in the context where democratic norms are under threat? What do you think the power of a grassroots movement from bottom up is? I think it's pivotal. I also think that a lot of, um, again, the misinformation on what a refugee is um, and who is a refugee, who gets to decide what a refugee looks like? Who gets to decide that, right? So I think that grassroots movements are critical because we are the voters and those folks in DC work for us. But not only that, they got to DC because we decided locally that they could decide for us. So we've got to, as, as grassroots movements, we've got to make sure that we talk about um, where do these candidates stand on immigration rights? Where do we stand on refugee rights? But more than that, what is their experience? If you ask anyone, do you know a refugee? They will say no. And yet, we are the housekeepers, we are the gardeners, we are the bankers, we are most of us have been refugees, have moved around. So I, I think that grassroots movements have a way of making sure that we hold our politicians accountable to task. I'm a firm believer that I am living the American dream, but not only that, our current vice president is the daughter of immigrants. So I think that it's critical that grassroots movements push on these politicians, which are people that work for us, local, state, to federal, to make sure that they understand that immigrants are the backbone of this country and will continue to be. Thank you. Um, Mark, HIAS is an international organization with offices in dozens of countries. And tonight's conversation is about democracy specifically with regard to refugee um, policy. But I'm wondering, and for everyone in the room, during the, during the 1930s and 1938, there was a conference held in Evian, France, where 32 different countries gathered to have a conversation about the massive refugee crisis of Jews trying to flee violence and persecution in Europe. 
and only one country agreed to accept additional Jewish refugees, and that was the Dominican Republic, which at that time was not a democracy. So I'm wondering if there are examples of non-democracy countries in the world that are safe havens for refugees today. Yeah, it's, it depends how you define safe haven. But when you look at the countries that are the largest hosts of asylum seekers, um, they actually tend to be non-democratic countries. Uh, the number one asylum hosting country right now is Iran, um, which people don't realize. The number five country is Pakistan. The number two country is, is Turkey. Um, so these are all countries which are, I mean, Iran is authoritarian, the others are considered to be kind of uh, sketchy. Democratic Democracies. <laughs> yeah, Democrat, they think the, the, um, uh, the economist calls them hybrid uh, countries, mix of authoritarianism and, uh, and democracy. Um, but yeah, many countries are because, uh, and, and in fact, when you have a democratic country, there tends to be, as I said, this populism that rises up against asylum seekers and refugees. And, uh, and that voice often drowns out uh, the need to protect them. So it, it, it's quite ironic, actually. Um, and I'm gonna ask, I think, each one of our panelists one more question and then open it up for the audience Q&A so everyone start thinking now of their excellent questions. I was wondering, Zoe, um, if you can talk a little bit about what you would hope everyone in the audience leaves with. We are facing, and this is actually gonna be a similar question I'll ask each of you, but we are facing a significant election year, and so much of your work is person to person, talking about the individual stories, the empathetic human response. And if you wanted everyone in this room to leave with one task, or one thought, or one idea, what would you want them to leave with? I think I would pray and try to beg everybody to really get back to the humanitarian part of yourselves and that humanity is just sort of the last thing anybody thinks of anymore and it's the most important thing. And so if somebody's leaving home and they're leaving their family, their children coming by themselves, making, you know, trekking from Sudan to Tijuana, why are they leaving? Think about why they're leaving. If anybody is ever to leave their home, for me, sometimes like even to go to Palm Springs with three children, I don't want to do it. Imagine having to leave your entire life, your entire family, and, and everything you know to start over from scratch with no one really rooting for you. So I guess that's what I would hope for. And Emiliana, I mean, in addition, I think you reminded us all to call our senators and our representatives. But what other action items would you want people to do when they leave here tonight, considering the fact that we're entering significant election year? I would say to volunteer. I think that volunteering is critical. Um, I volunteer way too many <laughs> things. But realistically, it is join a, a movement, really volunteer. And if you can't volunteer, donate. We run a program called Digital Divas to battle disinformation. You could do it during your lunchtime, 30 minutes. And once you look at what is out there and you are able to volunteer, especially for 2024, when we're looking at an election that is going to affect so many things, um, I think it's critical that you find an organization to volunteer your time with, but also it eases the anxiety about everything that is going on because you know you've made a difference. Um, so I would say truly um, volunteer with a political organization named Women's March. <laughs> but truly volunteer your time um, to make a difference. That is the only way democracy works. It is if we donate our time to make sure it thrives. And Mark, overseeing a, a massive nonprofit organization, what would you say to us who do live in a democracy what should we be doing to see meaningful change happen? It's, it's really important to speak out, uh, to correct, and to let, you know, there sometimes politicians who are pro-refugee, who understand the importance of refugee protection, take us for granted, and take, um, take refu refugees for granted. So even them you have to hold uh, accountable. So 
Okay, we have some questions in the back. So. We use the name Hyas, and actually we have done that for many, many years. Like Henry refers, and, and you can tell when we helped you by the way that you pronounce our name. Like Henry pronounces it Hyas, which is the way it was done in the 50s and 60s, and, and in the 70s and 80s when we started helping Soviet Jews, it became Hyas, um, and the rest of us say Hyas. But it, it, does, it did stand for, when we were founded in 1903, the Hebrew Immigrants Aid Society. We allow, um, well, first of all, now we help everybody, right? But when I started at Hyas, we did focus primarily on um, helping Jewish immigrants almost exclusively. And basically, it's self, they self-define, right? It, they self-identify. And in fact, so you would have I would have rescued you. In fact, I'll tell you a story. Um, Hyas has always had a tense relationship with, with Israel, frankly, because obviously we love Israel. It's, uh, um, it, it made our job so much easier after 1948 because it finally had a place where Jews could go so there were refugees no more. But um, there was always a tension because the American Jewish community made a decision in the early 1970s that as Jews in the diaspora, we cannot tell people they have to go to Israel. Like that would be hypocritical. So the American Jewish community made the decision, and Hyas was just the implementer of this decision, that when people left the Soviet Union, for example, and came to Vienna, they should have freedom of choice as to whether they go to Israel or to some other place. I, my first job at Highest was in Rome in, in the late 1980s, and one of the, the people that we had to deal with were people that Israel rejected, right? Like somebody, we had Hare Krishnas who were Jewish, but they had become Hare Krishnas, so they weren't eligible to go to Israel, for example. So Highest got those cases, um, along with anybody who wanted to go to places other than, um, other than Israel. Yes. Just talking we about are, this. So. That's such a good question. So, I mean, I, I we were talking about this earlier. Um, he, here in the United States, for example, and actually also in the in United Kingdom, those are two countries that were in a very unique position during World War II, in which they were never allied with Nazi Germany, never occupied, and came out victorious. So. In both of those cases, and I can speak more so about the US, but I imagine it's similar with the UK, um, they never had to confront decades of anti-Semitism. So in the 1930s here in the United States, there was massive Nazi movements. Um, here in Los Angeles, there were the silver shirts, which were basically the brown shirts who were actively getting Jewish people fired from their jobs because they were Jewish. When the United States joined the war in 1941, that all stopped. And then the US won the war, so they were viewed as the heroes, and nobody took a very hard look at themselves, at their country, at their society, at the systematic anti-Semitism that existed for decades, and said, we actually need to work on this. It was all sort of swept under the rug. And I think in a similar case in the UK, and even, even more complicated because the UK was in charge of the British mandate of Palestine after World War I, after the Ottoman Empire, and until 1948, where in some cases stirred up tensions in order to remain in power and didn't take ownership over that and didn't have to take ownership over anti-Semitism. So I think in, in both cases with the US and the UK, you're looking at two societies that have never had to confront anti-Semitism because of what happened sort of around 1945, 1948. Um, is what I would say is part of it, where people sort of are not necessarily always anti-Semitic, but have a tolerance for anti-Semitism that's never been challenged. But go on, because you said earlier, you explained why you think now it's kind of rising to the surface. And part of the reason why it's rising to the surface is because the generation that lived to see the defeat of Nazi Germany, to see the liberation of concentration camps, to see truly the most horrific things that human beings can do to one another because of hate rhetoric going unchecked, that generation has passed away. And so we not only have this undercurrent that has existed, but we also don't have that generation that says, wait, I was there, I saw what happens. I saw what happens when hatred goes unchecked. I saw, I liberated the camps. 
my friends liberated the camps. I mean, I, I believe a few years ago, this is already now probably six or seven years ago, we had a Republican senator say, my brother did not die fighting the Nazis in order for me to see Nazi flags and marches here in the United States. And that generation is no longer here. So that I think is also part of this effort. And also I would say now, to plug where I work professionally, um, the need for Holocaust education and really to have those conversations and to truly, I mean, we're sitting right now in a gallery where there are images that were taken by liberating soldiers who they themselves were 19, 20 years old and confronted with, with really the cruelty of humanity. So that's what I would say is really the importance of education. In what, in what, differently in what way? Like, in terms of I think it's because there's a need for us to stop being okay with hatred and anti-Semitism and, and sort of face our own backgrounds. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering why the people have, have found ourselves in a position where we're so out of touch and so easily I think because at the core, everyone is just moving so fast and so selfish that they're not looking around. And so much of life right now is so heavy and so intense that it's so much easier to just see it, turn it off, and continue and keep it moving. Go to your job, deal with your kids, meet your boyfriend for a drink, whatever it is. And so I think when you actually stop and you pay attention and you say, like, this is not okay, and then it becomes something inside of you that, you know, the reason I started This Is About Humanity was because I was a mom looking at these children and looking at these moms and thinking to myself, I would never survive if my child was taken from me. And I don't know that he would, my three boys would either. And the same feeling, and the only thing that separated me and those moms was literally where we were born. And so the same thing that I felt in 2016, I feel today as I'm watching and I'm hearing and I'm listening and I'm driving down Wilshire with my kids in the car and there's a you know, huge protest, and they're screaming, fuck the Jews, gas the Jews. And I'm with my child, and my 11-year-old is saying, why are they holding Hamas flags? Like, it's almost, it can't even, he can't even understand it. And everybody has just gone for what feels in the moment to them like the right thing or the righteous thing instead of taking a minute to stop to learn, to ask a question, to have a conversation. And when everyone's too scared, like what you were saying, when everyone's too scared to have a conversation, to say, wait, explain this to me. Why is it okay? If, if, if someone said this about any other group of people, this wouldn't be okay. Why? Explain it to me. The minute the conversation stops because you're so petrified of somebody coming at you or you don't want to be, you know, you don't want to be branded as something you're not, then everything goes away because if there's no conversation and we're not interacting and we're not asking the questions, then we just continue on the way we're going. It's also easier, there's this mentality of like, well, that's mine, that's for me. I want that job, I want that, I need that. And so no one is sort of looking at each other as partners in this. The only way you can make something happen is if you work together, if you stop yourself and your life and you partner with somebody else and make a difference? Yes. I would say this is a great question for all three of our panelists. Like, how would each of you work or have um, examples to get the word out to people who might not know where to go but want to be a part of helping refugees and asylum seekers? We can go down the list so you can start. <laughs> um, so, I guess the way we work with people in Tijuana is that um, my two partners are sisters. They're born and raised in Tijuana. So one of us is there um, five days a week. Um, we work with 12 shelters, and she visits each shelter every single day. So that is, you know, that is, that is how we interact down there. Um, we are also under ICF, which is International Community Foundation, so they, they, we're under their umbrella, so they help us a lot with all that kind of stuff. We have a website, and we have an Instagram. I don't know if you're on Instagram. Oh, 
Okay. <laughs> but, but we have a website. We have a website, and we can exchange phone numbers. The last, um, the last talk I did here, somebody in the audience, you know, we exchanged numbers, and she came on my bus um, and came to Tijuana with me. So we can definitely exchange. But I, I'm going to say the same thing. It's a website for us. We have a phone number, so we're sort of a hotline for everything. Um, but aside from that, it, sometimes in the work that we do, having offices becomes a little bit dangerous. As I know for a lot of um, social justice groups, our last office, um, we were working on reproductive rights and especially for um, immigrant rights. Um, so our front office was burned. They set it on fire. So we are in offices, we do have phone numbers, but email us. <laughs> email us and we tend to connect social justice warriors as I call ourselves tend to connect and if we don't we don't do what it is that you're looking for we usually know of an organization that is healthy so connect with it's harder for us because we don't have an office it's literally three of us that's it there's no board it's just the three of us we work out of each of our houses we don't have a phone number unless it's my personal phone number but I'll give it to you <laughs> And Mark, yeah. how would you say? And, and it's, it's the same with us. I mean, Hyas, we, we have a website. We use, we use social media. We have Joe Goldman in the back of the room who, who organizes us here in, in Los Angeles and the, and the West Coast. He's, he's based here. We organize through uh, synagogues, congregations, and, and partnerships like with this museum. So I guess to rephrase the question um, for our panelists, what do we as citizens or we as our democracy and our government have, in your opinion, a different set of standards or do we have a different set of standards for people fleeing crises that were perpetuated or pushed by American foreign policy? I would say that it's a facade for some, in, some people will say that um, the United States helped people from El Salvador. You didn't help people from El Salvador. You needed to clean up your crimes. So that's part of it. The other part of it is looking at when folks come to the United States, what they are looking for is a better life. You don't want to trek across the border for three days without water, not knowing if you're gonna live, unless what's at the other corner is better than death, because you're going to die in that country. So yes, the United States has had committed, I'm gonna say, a lot of crimes in these countries, but these countries also have issues that their government refuses to accept for its citizens. So when we talk about that, when we talk about folks coming to this country, yes, that in the 80s, El Salvador was, uh, I traveled there, right? And, and so when asking people to wait in El Salvador to, for asylum, to then come and wait in Mexico where Mexico cannot feed its citizens either, 
right? So we kept moving them across. And then they get, we get here and everyone is Mexican because we crossed the Mexican border. And then you understand that it was Guatemala, El Salvador, and currently from Venezuela all across the country. So yes, the United States has a lot to, to talk about, but it's also part of history. And as we all know, history is not really being taught as true history in the United States. Do we have it? just, I wanna make sure everyone, anyone who hasn't asked a question yet? Okay. Oh, okay. So the question is about if, if Zoe has been able to get any elected officials on the buses with her down to the border. But I, I guess also the question is for any of our panelists, have they worked with elected officials and bringing them specifically, I know Mark, you definitely have, um, bringing elected officials to have that human connection. We have had elected officials come. Um, we also have done um, specific bus trips for you know certain um, certain communities that, so it's been like, you know, just lawmakers and stuff, you know, I mean, we, we definitely have, so. Yeah, the, the most important work we did back in the 90s was we would always bring congressional delegations and congressional staff delegations to refugee camps and to see what refugees were going through and to, to speak to them, and that was the most effective work we did, and we were able to get some real serious policy changes because of that. Unfortunately, um, the ethics rules in, in Congress changed and made it pretty much impossible for us to, to do those trips, which is really a shame. We have to find some other way uh, to have that exposure. Oh, yeah. We did recently, as my <laughs> chairman just told me. Um, you know, we, we, the, the um, UN ambassador, uh, the US ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, did recently make a mission to, to Chad, and we made sure that we encouraged her to spend time with, uh, with our projects and our programs and to have that face-to-face -face encounter, and, and she did, and that was very effective. And just following up on that thread, most of the work that, or some of the work I imagine that's being done in Chad right now is a direct impact from the genocide in Darfur. Oh, absolutely. I mean, these are all people who fled the genocide in, in Darfur. And the sad thing is they fled, and we've been there since 2005, and they're still there, and they still can't go home, and they, they all want to go home. And I guess this brings us I guess, to another point is what, what are the impacts that we see of, and, and this is a two-part question, what are the impacts that we see of genocide on refugee crisis and asylum seekers. And when, and can you speak a little bit to the decision that people have between wanting to go home and or looking for a new home? And what goes into that decision? Yeah, that's, um, that's a big question. There's certain experiences that people go through, like genocide, where it, even though the threat to their lives may be over, they cannot return home, like mentally, they cannot return home. And this is when the United States government um, made the refugee definition as such to say that it's not just about, you know, normally a refugee has to prove that they have a well-founded fear of persecution based on race, religion, nationality, social group, or political opinion. So you have to show that you have that forward fear, but under US law, if your past persecution was so severe um, and you can establish past persecution, it doesn't matter that country conditions have changed. You still can access refugee status because of that. Um, and, but it's really, you know, but in most cases, if country conditions have changed, then you, you do return home unless, you've, unless your past persecution was so severe that it really would not be reasonable. <laughs> so, I would say, just, again, going to what I said earlier, 
Um, there is a centuries old tradition of scapegoating Jews, centuries old. And when people don't look at history and don't understand history, they repeat it. So that is what I will say to that. But I do think that you're asking a really good question about humanitarian crises that are existing, I would say, in, in every continent on the Earth, including Antarctica, even though humans don't live there, but the environment is definitely a critical issue for all of us. So I would rephrase the question as, what can we do to educate ourselves, in each of your opinions, on what what is happening in the world? What is a good resource for us to learn about, whether it be Uyghurs in China or um, Rohingya in Myanmar? What can we do to learn about these, or even what's happening in the Congo, or all of these Darfur refugees in, in Chad? What could we be doing to better educate ourselves on things that might not be on the headline on CNN or the first thing we see on Instagram? Yeah. That's exactly the problem. I don't have an answer to that because that's the problem that we are grappling with because there's more refugees right now. There's more displaced, more displaced persons right now than there has been at any time in human history. And, and at, at highest, we've just stopped doing scenario planning because the world keeps exceeding our worst case scenarios. What happened on October 7th? No one would have ever predicted that. What happened with Russia invading Ukraine? Nobody would have ever predicted that. The, the genocide of the Rohingya in this day and age, nobody would have predicted that that could happen today. But it keeps happening over and over and over again. And just the, 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 the country, the world, doesn't have the bandwidth for all of this suffering and persecution that's going on in the world. So I don't have the answer for that, but if anybody else does, I would love to hear it. And you're right, the American news system doesn't help either, where apparently we only have the capacity to follow one news story a week. Um, so yeah, you, you've identified the problem, and I don't have the solution. How many refugees are there in the world? Well, there's, a, there's 108 million people who have been forced to flee their homes. Um, there's about 27 million people who have crossed the international border. So I know that we're coming up a little bit on time, and I want to allow people to have conversations with our panelists, speak to one another, learn from one another. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming here and sharing personal experiences, professional experiences, and insights that I think really shape the way that we might be considering our role in society and our role in humanity, and reminding us that we need to remember that these are people behind statistics, these are people behind news sources, that the importance of grassroots movements and volunteering, even if it's 15 minutes a day, and further educating ourselves and holding our Congress people and our politicians accountable and really paying attention to what bills may or may not be passing because of one senator's vote. So I want to thank each of you for really inspiring us this evening, and I know that we're all leaving with a lot to think about and maybe just a thought about being kinder to a stranger, to a neighbor, to someone we know. Um, when we see maybe polarizing information on social media, on the news, in our kids' schools, at a protest, maybe we just take a breath and a beat before we respond and remember that these are all human beings behind these words and these photos. So thank you all for coming this evening. Thank you to our panelists. This has been an incredible conversation. Thank you.